All right. Sam? Yeah? yeah? All right. Good morning. My name is Mary Turner. I'm the president of Minnesota Nurses Association, and more importantly, I'm an ICU nurse at North Memorial Hospital in Robbinsdale, Minnesota. From the state capitol to the bargaining table and the picket line, Minnesota nurses have raised our voices in the past year about the crisis of understaffing, retention, and patient care. There is a reason for that. The problems in our hospitals are getting worse, not better. Surveys show that half of all nurses are thinking of leaving the bedside in the next year, and that is terrifying. When patients walk into a Minnesota hospital, they shouldn't be wondering if the hospital will have only half the nurses they need to provide the care patients expect and deserve. And the number one reason nurses give for why they are leaving the bedside is short staffing by hospital executives. In our hospitals, nurses fill out concern for safe staffing forms when they feel that unsafe staffing levels might threaten patient care. In the last year alone, those reports increased 7.4% to a total of 8,437 forms that were submitted. And in more than 89% of those cases, nurses reported that hospital managers ignored their concerns or failed to take appropriate action. Nurses want to be at the bedside, providing care to the patients. That is what we signed up to do. We did not sign up to put our well-being, our patient's care, or our nursing license on the line. A recent study from the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing confirmed that nurses have not left the bedside due to the pandemic, but due to unsafe staffing conditions and executives and managers who fail to solve these problems. If we can't keep nurses at the bedside in Minnesota, that is a patient care crisis. That is a public health crisis. Adverse events in our hospitals went up 33% last year for patients. We cannot wait any longer. With half of all the nurses ready to leave the bedside, we need action now. The future of our nurses, our patients, and our health care system demand that we solve the nursing retention and care crisis today. Thank you. I would like to now introduce an m &A nurse, Rachel Hanneman. Uh, good morning. My name is Rachel Hanneman, and I'm an RN at M Health Fairview in Southdale right now. I've been in healthcare since 2011 when I started as a CNA, and I now currently work as an RN. Becoming a nurse was once the single most important thing in the world to me. I had applied three years in a row to programs that were saturated with applicants, with one school telling me that they had over 500 candidates for 35 spaces. I had to take a staggered approach with my education to get where I am now, racking up student loans along the way in order to be eligible to meet admission criteria. Eventually, I was successful graduating from an LPN program before restarting the process to get my RN degree. Even at that time, many of my graduating class recognized the unsustainable conditions in hospital settings where nurses were overworked, understaffed, and lacked time off for work-life balance. Many of the nurses I graduated with instead went to work on in clinic settings. The situations in our hospital were dire prior to the COVID pandemic, and the landscape of hospital nursing has only gotten worse. Many nurses that fulfilled their duties to the public during the crisis have now joined the clinic nurses and have found that the time off they get with their families, the relief on their bodies, and the safer, less threatening environment are worth the slightly lower hourly pay. Many of our bedside care staff, our CNAs, began in healthcare as aspiring nursing students only to quit both their bedside jobs and quit their nursing programs as they recognize becoming a nurse means constantly being asked to pour from an empty cup. When I had my youngest child, I stopped pumping at work when she was six months old because I had to choose between taking a meal break on a 12-hour shift, feeding my infant, and getting out on time. With the number of patients I had to, working constantly understaffed, I only had time for one of those options, and I had a family to make it home to every morning. I remember when a coworker of mine was assaulted on the job and her prescription glasses were broken. Because the hospital had short staff nurses, as they always did, she, told, she was told that she couldn't go home and that she had to finish her shift. Last week in violence prevention class, we were practicing self-defense and painless takedowns of assault to patients, and the moral of the story of that class was, you're going to get hit. We'll just teach you how to avoid getting hit in the head where it's gonna do less damage. Simply put, the current system we have for healthcare is not one that we can sustain our workforce through. We need changes to solve the crisis of short staffing that's pushing nurses out of the profession. 
Unfortunately, the writing on the wall shows that the change isn't the intention of our hospital executives. What we saw during contract negotiations was not only that there were no, we were no longer frontline heroes, but our administration will do as little for us as is required by law. Our not-for-profit healthcare system will do what is right, but only after it's tried every single thing it can do first. We won the contract, but unless permanent change is made for every nurse and every patient at every hospital around the state, we will continue to see worsening conditions at the bedside and more and more nurses will be pushed away. We now have Becky Nelson. Good morning, everyone. My name's Rebecca Nelson. I'm a registered nurse. I work at Alina's Abbott Northwestern Hospital in Perry Anesthesia. I am proud to serve as the chair of MA Governmental Affairs Commission. The issue of understaffing really is personal to me. I have lost many coworkers. I know multiple RNs who've left the bedside for lower stress positions in the last three years. I know nurses that have retired early. Um, I know many nurses have reduced the hours that they're working because of the stress. Um, and some have just completely left the workforce. They're no, no longer working or no longer working as nurses. I've personally stayed working on the job, um, but not without some serious health consequences that have needed medical care. Um, I've experienced depression that has required some additional treatments, and I've had stress-related hair loss, and there have been some other more personal things that I'm not willing to discuss on camera, but there are, there's other issues as well. Um, we're really devastated at the impacts um, on our patients of the current crisis in the hospitals. We want to provide outstanding care to our patients, but we are pressed to do more and more with less and less. I'm very grateful to these legislators that are here today who listen to Minnesota nurses who desperately want to remain at the bedside about changes, about what changes are necessary to solve the understaffing and retention crisis our hospital executives have created. I actually love my job. I love what I do. I love the patient care that I do. Um, the staffing is untenable um, and it's, it, it actually does affect the way that I view my job. I have certainly, I have applied for several different jobs over the last year or so. Um, I have one open application right now, but I, you know, I, I would prefer to stay at my job. I do wanna say that. Um, these legislators have listened to us. Um, they're ready to lead this fight. And now is the time for the Minnesota legislator to act. The future of our profession and our healthcare system depends on it. Thank you. I'm here to introduce Senate Assistant Majority Leader Erin Murphy, Chief Author of the Senate Bill. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Erin Murphy. I am a registered nurse, currently licensed. Uh, I also happen to serve in the Minnesota Senate, and I am the chief author of the legislation that has the intention and the purpose to keep our nurses, our experienced nurses, at the bedside. This is a very, very important piece of legislation and it's coming at a critical moment for our healthcare institutions and in this case our hospitals and the purpose of providing excellent healthcare for Minnesotans who are sick and in need of care. And for any of us who have been in a hospital, you know that you're there for nursing care, skilled, nursing care. You don't go to the hospital for anything but that. I have been a part of this effort to make sure that our hospitals are safely and adequately staffed for my entire legislative career. And I am recalling today, as I listen to the testifiers, the nurses who are here, a hearing in the Minnesota House where we took up this legislation and nurses brought stacks of concern for safe staffing forms to the committee expressing in a quantitative way the concerns and the worries and the fear and the outcomes of short staffing in our hospitals. And I remember committee members asking if those were valid documents, were those valid concerns, questioning the judgment of the professional nurses who were testifying and saying there is a problem in our hospitals and we need help. And I remember at the end of that hearing asking, what if the nurses are actually telling us the truth? They have been. And we have watched the staffing crisis in our hospitals go from bad to worse, exacerbated by 
both a pandemic and what we knew was coming, which is the loss of workers because of retirements in the great generation, the baby boomers leaving the workforce. And so here we are now working and hearing from nurses, both in their contract negotiations and back here at the legislature saying we need help. Because as they're telling us, more than half of nurses are considering leaving the bedside. And adverse events, which should never happen, are on the rise. They are signaling to all of us that we need to take action. And it's not just about building a pipeline for new nurses. Because we know over and over again in the data that nurses come into the profession like I did back in 1985, knowing I was going to take a job that was going to test me, that it was going to be difficult, that I was going to be in precarious situations with the obligation to do my very best to care for the person in my hands. Nurses know that. They know they're not coming into a profession that's easy. But when understaffed, when exhausted, they know mistakes happen. And they are asking for our help. And as policymakers, if our goal is a healthy population and safe patient care, we can no longer ignore, we can no longer ignore the pleas of our professional registered nurses across the state. We can't continue to build the pipeline and have nurses coming into a system that burns them out and sends them out. Instead, it is time for us to do what they have asked us to do, to put in place the conditions so they stay in their jobs because experienced professional registered nurses are the ones who are gonna provide the high standard of quality care that we expect in our hospitals, and that's my goal. That is why I'm the author of this legislation. That is why I stand with the nurses. This legislation is important. It is refined. It has made it all the way through the House of Representatives in the last term. And it's time now for us to get it across the line in the Minnesota Senate and make it law. And with that, I'm happy to introduce the House author, Representative Sandra Feist. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am incredibly honored and excited to be here today with the Minnesota Nurses Association as the chief house author of the Keep Nurses at the Bedside Act. This bill is about all of us. As a mother, I think of my children. As a daughter, I think of my parents. This is about our families. This is about all patients in Minnesota. Safe staffing is the best way to retain nurses and bring nurses back, as well as decrease violence and prioritize quality patient care. I've spoken with nurses from my district over the past two years, um, and they have told me stories that have stuck with me and are the reason that I'm standing here today with the nurses. Um, one of my constituents told me the story of a colleague of hers who took their own life because of unsafe staffing. Uh, they could not handle it. Um, an experienced nurse in my district with over three decades of experience retired a year and a half early um, from uh, where she was serving in a mental health ward um, because of weekly multiple attacks on staff. Um, one of my uh, constituents is a labor and delivery nurse who said she was so overstaffed that she was not able to give the attention that she knew that new parents and their babies needed. Um, and those stories have really stuck with me. Um, I've also heard stories from the M&A um, that are terrifying, and they should be terrifying to all of us. Um, pelvic exams performed in hallways. Patients with open heart surgery waiting in hallways for a bed because of uh, understaffing. Um, patients discharged without guidance only to end up in the ER a day later because they weren't given proper instructions um, on how to care for themselves after their hospital stay. Um, and as I mentioned, multiple assaults on a weekly basis as, as one of our speakers discussed, like this is not okay. Um, staffing is at the heart of the Keep Nurses at the Bedside Act, but violence prevention and nurse recruitment are a big part of that big picture, and everyone agrees on that. Um, I am looking forward to a win-win for patients, nurses, hospitals, and all Minnesotans when we pass this bill this year. Thank you so much. And with that, I will turn it over to Senator Jim Abler. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. And I think it's been eloquently stated, I'm Senator Jim Abler from Anoka, by the way. It's been eloquently stated the challenges. This piece of legislation merely sets up committees at every hospital so they can talk about it at a hospital-by-hospital -hospital way how to handle these issues. 
Nurses don't wake up in the morning thinking, I hope I go get to pick at my hospital. I hope I get to threaten a strike. They wake up in the morning hoping they can go serve somebody. My wife is a nurse. The passion that you've heard from the two nurses here, the three nurses here, four nurses, sorry. Uh, the whole crowd behind me, <laughs> surrounded by nurses. Anyway, the, the passion you've heard from them today and the dozens of nurses that have come to me that I've met over my time, this is a 10 year issue or more, is like, we just want to help people. The people in the hospital don't know that they're at risk for, for not good care. With all the money they spend, they think they're going to some of the best care in the country. And these nurses behind me and the ones on the front lines at every hospital are eager to provide that for them. And so it's time. This hasn't been resolved in the contract. There's just, they just had a minimal, you can't go any lower. But the professionalism that these nurses bring is incredible. We're in our, some of the best trained in the country, and I'm so proud to be even connected to them. So there's a hole in the bucket, and they're leaving. And the pipeline, they're not even filling up the, the slots at Minnesota State. So it's time to make them feel safe at their work, to get the quality people expect. And I'm proud to stand with them today. Thank you. Take any questions? Uh, Senator Abler, um, I noticed that you weren't signed on to this legislation last term. What changed your mind this time? Unless, I, unless I'm looking oh. at an earlier iteration. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. I was the author of the legislation last term, and there were many senators who wanted to sign on, and Senator Abler was on a clone. Okay. He did sign on to this so there, legislation. So there, you've, you've endorsed this previously. You supported it last term, too. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So what are the prospects of for action in the Senate at this point, and also what needs to happen in the House and stuff? I, I believe that there is a lot of, there was a lot of support uh, for this legislation in the last term in our caucus, uh, and I believe that this proposal has strong support in our caucus and in the Minnesota Senate, in both chambers, excuse me, in both caucuses. I, I'm grateful that Senator Abler is here. I'm grateful for his partnership on this. It's important. It, it sends an important signal to our colleagues. More importantly, it sends an important signal to Minnesotans that this is a serious issue. It has garnered the support of both Democrats and Republicans, and it's time for us to move it in the Senate. Have you gotten commitments on hearings? I, I am quite certain that this bill is going to get a hearing, yes. If you ask um, hospital leaders, one of the things they'll say is, the reasons nurses have high caseloads right now, the reason the ERs are backed up is because they can't send patients out when they need to to nursing homes, to transitional care. Um, I'm wondering if any of this legislation is going to help with that upstream problem to, to address these downstream issues, and if not, shouldn't there be something? Uh, there are dozens and probably hundreds of vacant beds that, they, that cannot be staffed. And so... That's the issue, and then downstream, of course, and I'm on a different committee, we're trying to find ways to, do, to decompress the hospitals. The uh, Hennepin County has over 50 people sitting there, and so we need to find a way to move them out, and that's what uh, Senator Hoffman and I are working on with Senator Murphy and others to try to open up more beds everywhere. Is this bill different at all than last year's? I haven't had a chance to. Yeah. I I believe it's the same, yes, it is the same legislation. It addresses um, everything from um, giving help to getting more nursing instructors, to uh, uh, mental health support, to uh, addressing workplace violence, and then, of course, our, our staffing that we, you know, here's the thing, is that in our um, union hospitals, we have committees. Some work better than others. But this kind of legislation would hit every hospital, whether you're a union nurse or not. It shouldn't just be that you're a union nurse and so you have the ability to uh, be at the table to speak for your patients. I see a world where every nurse in Minnesota has the ability to advocate for their patients at the table with their employer. Yeah. But if you want to go on more about it. Specifically to the legislation, there are some changes in this proposal that I think are important, and it is a continued refinement of the proposal based on uh, both the feedback from nurses and from others. So you will see, uh, especially in the first article, uh, the way that the staffing committees and the there, there are two different uh, workforce committees that are set up uh, and intended to be in every hospital so that there is both a problem-solving mechanism and a staffing mechanism. 
uh, we will be considering in this legislation and if passed those concern for staff, stay safe staffing forms will be an element of reporting. And there is a public reporting element of this proposal. Uh, so if a hospital sets up uh, its staffing proposal, its staffing committees, and they don't meet it, that will be reported. So the public has a way to judge as well. So I, I, this, this legislation over the years has continued to change, to be refined, to be more detailed, uh, so that the nurses and their professional judgment is being embedded in this question and the work of how we make sure that our hospitals are safely staffed. What's the cost of this? What's the cost of this? Uh, thank you for the good question. I don't have a fiscal note yet. We're hearing about months, months, people waiting months to get licensed for their license to be processed. Is there anything the legislature can do to deal with that? I mean, part of the staffing shortages is because people can't get licensed fast enough. So, uh, Max, I will, um, I'm going to come back to you on that. Um, I know that the Board of Nursing has been, they've had a longstanding record of quick uh, very quick uh, approval um, between, you know, that when you take your NCLEX and getting your license or if you're coming from another place and getting your license uh, recognized or uh, and when uh, you uh, have to renew it. So if there's a backup of that uh, nature, I haven't heard that, uh, so I'll come back to you on that. Mary, can you just clarify something? You were talking about the envisioning all hospitals, regardless if they have a union or not, being able to have this way to, to weigh in about staffing. Um, can you clarify, was that a term in the most recent contract for the Minnesota Nurses Association about having committees similar to this? I, I don't know if I misheard you. Well, the reality is, and, and maybe, you know, I haven't visited all these non-union hospitals. They, they could have committees, but if we can put this into state legislation, then it won't matter whether you're a union hospital or not. You'll be able to have all of these things that are in uh, they'll have to create committees. They'll have to be able to monitor and um, have have a con have some kind of uh, concern for safe staffing form, whether that be the one that MA has. But they, it, it's my understanding that if this goes into law, then whether they're a union hospital or not, they will have to actively address the nurses' issues. So, Mary, um, fifty-one percent. Uh, of nurses wanting to leave the bedside. That was based on an Illinois survey in November of 2021. That's 15 months ago. Have mm -hmm. half the nurses left the bedside in the past 15 months or anything close to that? I would have, Sam, uh, that's still. Considering is the key word there. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering if considering, considering resulted in actual, yeah. that mm -hmm. kind of dire result. Yeah, yes. I mean, so, on a day to day basis, you're uh, on a day to day basis, I know on, on my floor, they continue to have nurses wanting to move on to other things. Here's the thing nowadays, you know, all our nurses are highly educated and they have so many opportunities. And I know that during the contract, work-life work balance was huge. And the younger generations are wanting more work-life balance. They want better schedules. That's another part of it. And they have choices. They have other opportunities. And so to sit and have where they're working day, night, night, day, day, night, and then also in the meantime, taking on increasingly difficult acuity without any more resources. Because our contract kind of established, I think at Fairview was the best, that said it wouldn't get any worse. Okay, well that doesn't improve anything. Okay, and in the meantime, while our hospitals are potentially promising for it not to get any worse, our acuity is getting worse. Okay, and this is, and the younger nurses, God love them, that they should speak out and not put up with it, are saying, no, we have other, we have other choices. And that's what we intend to do. We're not going to stay there. You know, during the negotiating, the workplace violence alone, we at North Memorial, we resolved our, that proposal at the very beginning. But towards the end here, every single week, my floor alone, we were bringing back violent issues of a nut, a, yet another nurse, another couple nurses every weekend that were being beat up. And so we just get in there, well, we already solved this. It doesn't matter. I'm coming from a week where another couple nurses were, were assaulted and, hurt, and severely hurt. This is the kind of thing that causes our young nurses to say, 
it's not worth it. There must be something else I can do. So this is one of the things that seems different to me this year than last year is that there is more talk of violence. Can you t what is causing the violence? Is it I mean is it just low staffing ratios? Is it difficult cases? Is it all of it together? Why is there more violence? Part of it seriously part of it is there is more and more as we all know more and more um, uh, there's more substance abuse. You know I work in an ICU. There's more uh, mental health issues, you know, patients coming in. And then there's the whole uh, there's the whole uh, societal that no rules apply. You know, it used to be that you didn't have to worry about people's behavior, visitors, patients in a hospital. It was kind of a sacred zone. You know, yeah, you, you didn't, you didn't mer dare make a ruckus. Well, we've been starting to discuss at our hospitals that we need codes of conduct for visitors codes of conduct for patients and things like that because it's getting so out of hand. And so it's, it's, it's a multifaceted reasons, but being short-staffed and not having enough uh, nurses to go assist other nurses and part of, part of why, why patients get frustrated and maybe uh, potentially get violent or, or you're not able to catch it is if you're chasing after too many patients. You know, you try to do eight patients on the night shift on a med surge floor um, and then try to make sure that you got to everybody on an hourly basis so that they don't get frustrated. See, that's, that's where it comes because everybody at midnight wants their pain meds, all eight of them, all at the same time so that they can go to sleep. Well, unless I'm an octopus, you know, I can't. You know what I'm saying? That, and people don't realize that that's why having more patients than what you can do is because the patients want everything in their minds, it's only them. And they wa everybody wants that same care all at the same time. And that's impossible when, we, uh, when you don't have enough nurses. That's just impossible to do. Uh, Mary, can, you kind of touched on it first, where the contract falls short in terms of having all these committees, whether union or non-union hospitals, but where else did your contract negotiations fall short and where does this pick up? Or for anyone, really? Um, well, like I said, I think Fairview is the only one that promised that it wouldn't get any worse. And so as far as staffing, that was the 51% that Jeremy had alluded to. We tried to get the, where if there were going to be grid changes on a floor, that 51% of your nurses had to agree to it. They adamantly opposed that. Um, my rationale was if you can't convince half your nurses that this grid change, the staffing change is a good one, then it maybe shouldn't be done. But they, have, they were adamantly against any kind of 51% of us would have to agree to a change. Okay? So... Bill largely takes care of the staffing issue. Well, you, I'm going to bow to you as far as the real particulars because yeah. I don't want to get caught yeah. saying something that. I, I, for, for since the 1940s, the Minnesota Nurses Association has uh, gone to the employer in a collective way uh, to bargain over working conditions and safe staffing and their professional obligations. Um, that will continue. Uh, and they achieved a contract, and of course I am not deep into uh, what the terms of that contract is. Uh, we're here today to make sure that wherever a Minnesotan is getting their care, in whatever hospital, that nurses are coming together to say we want to make sure every patient is getting that high standard of care that we expect. And in this moment in time in Minnesota, and for some time now, there haven't been enough nurses to guarantee that standard, and we want to make that a statewide standard, and that's why this legislation is so important. Senator, if I may ask, um, Could I say something? Please. Yeah. Um, that's, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think an important um, aspect to the bill that we're introducing this year is also the public-facing aspects of it, so talking about a grading system um, within MDH, and also just information um, at the unit, at the bedside, about the ratios that have been set and whether they're being met. Um, and I think that's a really important aspect to this legislation that would not have been addressed in negotiations. How is work on a basis, um, and I'm sorry I'm joining late, but um, the, if the committee decides 
a certain level and the hospital can't meet that level? Do you turn patients away or do you hire temporary staff? How do you deal with the results of this, the, the maximum ratio that, that this committee would determine, floor by floor or hospital by hospital? Yeah, you know, we, we kind of had, obviously we had this problem during the pandemic and like we, we still are using agency to fill in. Um, uh, still having, I know at our hospital, we haven't actually have an established bonus structure in our contract that I personally would love to see in all of the contracts. Um, there are ways to get, get the staff and to motivate people to pick up the shifts, et cetera. Um, I, I would like to say that if you're, if you're a hospital, and, you're, and, you're, and you have a grading system that you can look at and you're a brand new nurse out of school and you're, and you're checking out all the hospitals and there's an actual grading system that you can look at, that is going to affect who you're gonna go apply at, okay? And also, uh, you know, my whole career, I have worked with nurses from like North Dakota. And when we unionized a hospital up in Bismarck, I asked them, I said, is it my imagination or like do like two thirds of your nursing classes get on the first train and head south to the cities? They said, that's exactly what happens because the benefits are better, the staffing at the time was better, you know? And so this kind of grading system, this will actually, this will be like a commercial if it's done right and, and it, and it, and it, it creates an open, a transparent look into our hospitals, hospitals could benefit from that because nurses will want to come to our hospitals. Senator, I wanted to ask, um, I know you empower committees to come up with answers to this, but the idea of preventing boarding in emergency rooms, it almost seems impossible or conflicting with federal and common law. Are you creating an unreasonable standard for hospitals if they can't get around federal law and they have to take in all comers? I think that we have to imagine again what a hospital's purpose is. It is to provide care for people who are sick. Nurses are saying there aren't enough of us to do our jobs and do them well. And we want to solve that problem. And we want to create the conditions so that the nurses who are experienced choose to stay. Yes, we've got to look at the pipeline. Yes, we should look at workplace violence. Those are right. Those are things are right. And yes, m and is going to continue to negotiate wages and benefits. Yes. But there is a fundamental problem right now. Nurses are choosing. They're raising their hands. They're saying, I can't do it this way. Um, and so the, the problem that you're describing, boarding in the hospitals, or the issue that you're raising, John Croman, in terms of can we meet the numbers, those are real issues. And we are saying we are gonna be in a better position to solve those problems if we have adequate, well-trained, experienced nurses in our hospitals. And that's the goal of this legislation. Hey, thanks for your time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.